from the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street, right next to the High Museum of Art in Midtown Atlanta. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church. I'm Senior Pastor Tony Sundermeyer, and I want to thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. And I would invite you now to join us in the worship of God. Our New Testament reading comes from John chapter 6, verses 24 to 35. Please turn with me in your pew Bible to page 92 of the New Testament. Listen for and hear the word of God. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Cap Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you were looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it's on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from the heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second text is from 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11, verses 26 through chapter 12, verse 13. What I'm about to read uh, is part two, really, of what Rob started with part one last week. Uh, and I'll reference that text in just a little bit. But first, let me read what is before us now. When Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, heard that her husband was dead... She made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her, Bathsheba, to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor, the rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him, but... He took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And so he said to the prophet Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and, and gave you the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in God's sight. You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house and I will 
Take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Friends, this too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, break open this ancient word afresh to us this day so that we would uh, be different people than those who came into this sacred space uh, this morning. Even to be more like your son, Jesus the Christ, it's in his name that we pray. Amen. It was 1988. It was the fall semester of my eighth grade year. I was a student at St. Stanislaus Parochial Parish School when our history teacher brought both sections of the eighth grade class together uh, in preparation for the upcoming presidential election. She was going to give us a little bit of an exercise. She described to us that two students would be randomly selected from uh, the eighth grade to have a mock presidential debate in front of the whole eighth grade class. One student would play the Republican nominee, Vice President George H.W. Bush, and the other student would be selected to play the Democrat nominee, the governor of Massachusetts, Michael Dukakis. Some of you are old enough to remember this very election. Our history teacher went on to say that at the conclusion of the debate, every eighth grader, remember we're 12, 13 years old, 14 years old at the time, that every eighth grader would get a chance to vote who they would like to see be president. And I remember thinking to myself as our teacher explained what was going to happen in the upcoming weeks, I remember thinking to myself that if somehow I was chosen, if somehow I was was selected to play one of these presidential nominees, if somehow I was chosen, I thought, I better get Bush. I, I can't get Dukakis. There's no way I want to get Dukakis. Now, the, the sentiment was not driven by any political platform or ideology. As a 13-year-old, I wasn't that astute. It was more driven by what I knew about the polling and the prediction of that upcoming election. I had paid enough attention to the 6 o'clock news when it was on, when my parents were watching it, to know that Dukakis was a huge underdog. Everyone knew it. I even knew it. And as a competitive person, I like to win. And so I didn't want to play the would-be loser for this mock presidential debate. Well, anyway... The day of the selection came, and wouldn't you know it, that I was one of two students selected to participate in this uh, presidential debate. Our teacher then put the names of each candidate in a brown paper bag uh, and asked me and my friend to reach in and to, to pull out a name to see who, would we, who we'd be playing in the debate. I remember now... I, I was a good Catholic school boy. I remember offering up a little prayer in silence. Lord, please don't let, please let me be Bush. Please let me be Bush. Please don't let me be Dukakis. Please don't let me be Dukakis. I reach in. I pull out the name Dukakis. So I prepared for the debate, but I knew the outcome because everybody knew that Dukakis wasn't going to win and no one of my peers was going to vote for a loser. And and, and I did a great job, but it didn't matter. The vote was 70-30 in Bush's favor. And for those who remember, Bush did beat Dukakis by winning close to 80% of the Electoral College. It was a real blowout, which is precisely why I didn't want to play him in the first place. Now imagine for just a moment that, that we were about to reenact the story that I just read for you from 2 Samuel. And imagine that you had the opportunity, that you were selected to play a role within this tableau, within this acting out of this uh, story from 2 Samuel. You had the option to play the prophet Nathan, the option to play King 
David, which would you choose? I mean, just think about it for a minute. Who would you want to play with what you know about the story? Would you want to play Nathan or would you want to play David? Let's do a little bit of participation. Get the blood flowing a little bit here. How many of you would like to, would have liked to play the role of Nathan? Raise your hand if you'd like to play the role of Nathan. Yeah. This is consistent. People like the prophet rather than the sinner David. Yeah. How about, how about David? Who's bold enough and who would play David? A few. All right. I see in the back. I see in the back. Faithful Presbyterians who know John Calvin's theology of total depravity sitting in the way back like faithful Calvinists do. Yes, very good. Very good. Well, here's what I'd like to suggest for all of us this morning. I'd like to suggest that the friend of God and the follower of Jesus Christ is called to play in the life of faith both in the inner life of faith and in the outer life of faith, is called to play the role of both characters. What I'd like to suggest to you this morning is that we need to embrace both characters for the habits of our spiritual life, for the direction of the way we ought to go in following Jesus Christ, that we learn to play both roles, that we learn to be more like Nathan and we learn to be more like David, that we don't choose one or the other, but that we embrace both. Before we get into it, though, I just want to catch us up on the, the narrative. I know many of us are familiar with the story. I know some of us were here last week when Rob Sparks preached from the, the, the exact story that, that precedes uh, this one. And Rob focused on how King David took what he wanted to take. He took what he wanted to take. Some of you remember that in the second week of the series, all the way back to, I think it was the second week of June, I preached on a text from 1 Samuel where the people of Israel, they, they, they come to Samuel and they say to him, hey man, you're old, your days are done, we no longer want you as our leader, we want a new form of governance, in fact, we want a king. We want a king like the other nations. We want you to get out of the way and, and we want God to appoint a, a king for us. Now this displeased God. God took offense at this because God was their true king. They didn't need a human, frail, mortal, earthly king. They had God. And, and what happens is, is that God actually allows them to have a king. God allows them to have a king with this caveat. God says through the prophet that, that human beings are flawed. And so are kings. And you remember this? Some of you remember this. God said, kings take. They take what they want. They'll, they'll take your wives. They'll, they'll, they'll take your sons and put them on the front lines of battle. How ironic, how interesting that that word is actually a foreshadow of what David the king actually does. Kings take. And that's exactly, exactly what David did. David sees the wife of another man. Her name is Bathsheba. She's bathing on the roof. Roof. He forcibly takes her into his bed. She becomes pregnant. He wants to cover up the pregnancy by calling Bathsheba's husband, his name was Uriah, back home from battle so he could be intimate with her. But there was a rule operating during the day that, that if your brothers in arms were still at battle, that you would not experience the pleasures of this world. And so he refrained from spending time with his wife. And David then has to come up with another plan. This plan, he gives Uriah marching orders to take to the front line, where it says that he should fight on the front line almost guaranteeing his death. And that is exactly what we see, that Uriah is killed in battle. And chapter 11 actually ends with David thinking he got away with it. I'm the king. I take. I do what I want. But then verse 12 turns, and it opens with these words. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The thing David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. 
Nathan is a prophet. Nathan is called to confront David in his sin. And Nathan does it in a very subtle and savvy way. I've said in the last two services, I've used this illustration. One of my favorite movies of all time is The Godfather. Some of you may not be familiar with that film. I think many are. For 30 seconds, if you're not, just bear with me. Two of the sons of Don Corleone are Michael Corleone and Sonny Corleone. Sonny is played by James Caan and and Michael's played by Al Pacino. And, and they're both part of the same family, but they have very different tactics. James Kahn's character, Sonny, is brash. He's brazen. He, he just rushes into the fight without thinking. And that's actually what eventually gets him killed. But Michael is much more savvy, right? Michael is more uh, strategic. He's a, he's a planner. He's wise. He's thoughtful as he takes over his, his father's business. I imagine Nathan to be much more like Michael Corleone than Sonny Corleone. Michael, or uh, rather, Nathan knows exactly who he's dealing with, right? He's dealing with the most powerful man in his orbit. He knows that David could kill him just as easily as he killed Uriah, could take his life as easily as he took Bathsheba. And so he shows up with subtlety and savvy, and he begins with a parable. He says, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but this one little ewe lamb. And the parable describes how much love this man has for this one lamb. And then when this wayfaring stranger comes, you know, the law said that if someone comes to your door looking for hospitality, that you should give it to him. You know, the rich man, he wants to do what's right by the law, but then he breaks the law in doing it. Right? He wants to do right in the sight of God, but then he breaks God's law by taking the one thing that was precious to this poor man. And then David, after the parable concludes, has this righteous indignation. Literally, the text says that he was on fire, right? He, he, he was ready to render swift justice. Isn't it interesting, right, that, that it's so much easier to go after justice or restitution from, for someone else's sins than our own, right? I mean, that's a whole other sermon. But how easy was it for David to be kindled with fire and anger? And it's here that Nathan delivers the punchline to David. It's actually more of a gut punch. David, he says, you are the man. You're that guy. You're the man. You did these things. You're the transgressor. You abused. You murdered. You lied. It was you. You are the man. And it's here that I want to invite all of us to consider how we are called to play the role of Nathan from time to time. It's not all the time. But from time to time, God calls us to speak truth to power. From time to time, God calls us to be like the prophet Nehemiah and stand in the gap for those who can't stand. That God calls us to stand and speak on behalf of the marginalized and the vulnerable, like Bathsheba, who's treated like an object. She is objectified, a a piece of property that God calls us from time to time to stand in the gap and to speak truth to power. And this makes us very uneasy. I mean, let's just be honest about it. When we see injustices in the world, when we see injustices affect our neighbors or, or fellow citizens or fellow church members, there is this space where we do evaluate what will happen to us if we actually speak. Will I be ostracized? Will I be harmed? Will people break relationship with me? Will people pull away if I stand up for justice? If I stand up and speak the truth to power? Because we're not dumb people. We know what happens to prophets. If you're a Christian, you know what happens to prophets because you know what happened to Jesus. Prophets often suffer for the truth. Prophets often suffer for the justice of God. Prophets are often killed for their vision of what is possible. A name I've mentioned from this pulpit before is is one that belongs to a German pastor named Paul Schneider. Uh, Schneider holds the tragic distinction of being the first Protestant minister to be martyred by the Nazis in one of their concentration camps, July 18th, 1939. 
Schneider joined the Confessing Church movement. Students of history will know that the Confessing Church movement was that movement of Christians that, that sought to speak against the Nazi project, that sought to provide an alternative witness to what was happening in the German church with German Christians and their allegiance to Nazism. He regularly preached against Hitler and the Nazi party. In fact, he was so bold and courageous that he excommunicated members who came in wearing pins affiliating with the Nazi flag. I mean, could you imagine that? People coming in and, and he had the foresight and the prophetic vision to speak against that in real time. On the last Sunday, he got a chance to preach in his pulpit. He climbed in and, and preached a sermon calling people to repent. He, he was Nathan in that moment, calling people to turn away from Nazism and, and Hitler and turn towards Christ, saying in that sermon that you can't serve Hitler and the Nazi party and Jesus Christ. He drew a line in the sand. He finished that sermon and he, he left the church and he was on his way to another church when he was arrested by the SS and he was taken to Buchenwald, one of the concentration camps. I, I've been to that camp. I've, I've stood in his cell. I've, I've stood near the bunk that he used to climb. I saw the window that he would press his face against as roll call would be called out in the morning as the Jews would, would, would line up on the plots and the SS and the Gestapo surrounding them, calling name by name. Schneider would speak out about God's love, speak out about God's justice. He would speak out about the atrocities of such a sight. He would then turn to the SS guards and he would turn to the Gestapo and he would call for them to lay down their arms, call for them to repent. Every day he stood on that bunk and every day he preached the same sermon until a year after he was in prison there, they finally silenced him with a lethal injection. You see, we, we know what happens to prophets and, 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 and for folks like us, mainline Protestants and Presbyterians, we get a little worried when the preacher or the text starts to talk about speaking truth to power, but we cannot ignore this call. It's part of the Christian witness. It's part of what it means to be a friend of God and a follower of Jesus Christ. So let us not neglect that part. Let us not neglect the role we're called to play in Nathan's ministry. Equally as important, we're called to play the part of David. Obviously, I'm not advocating, just need to be clear about this, to be like David in 2 Samuel 11, right? That's obvious. Let's be more like David in chapter 12. And what I'm elevating here is how David responds to Nathan. How refreshing is it that when someone is confronted in their sin, their first response isn't to blame. Their first response isn't to justify their action. How refreshing is it that their first response isn't to say, well, I'm entitled to do this. The first response that David offers is confession. Notice what's not there. No rationalization. No passing the blame. He simply confesses. The timing is remarkable. When you think about our own lives, how often do we have to sit on something till we finally realize, oh, I really did make a mistake and I really do need to apologize. And then we wait even more after that. But David, there's an immediacy about this. And, and I think there's something to be learned about confession here. That when he is confronted, he says, yes, I am the man. He confesses it. He knows he's sinned. And I think there's something really important in this text about sin, right? The text, I don't know if you picked this up, but, but talks about David sinning against the law of the Lord, but also sinning against the Lord God's self, right? As one preacher put it, sin is double-sided. Sin is the rejection of the law of the Lord, but it's also the rejection of the Lord of the law. Sin is both moral and personal. Sin offends God. I want to close with, with this uh, illustration that will be turned into an invitation for all of us. I, I recently discovered in, in preparing for this sermon, I did not know this before my preparation for this week, but in medieval Hebrew manuscripts, right, this is pre the printing press, right? So this is when 
when there's scribes and transcribers and copyists who are copying biblical texts, right? And they're, and they're copy, copying the Hebrew. And this is before we thought that double space was good and, and, and pleasing to the eye, right? This is when everything is, is put together. But, it, but in medieval manuscripts, the copyists would get to the second book of Samuel, the 12th chapter and the 13th verse. And where it would be really tight, like line to line to line to line, the copyists would leave a huge amount of space it is very uncharacteristic for a transcriber to do something like this. A huge amount of space between David's confession and Nathan's response. And the reason the copyist did this was to indicate to the rabbi that it was time to read Psalm 51. We read Psalm 51 earlier as our prayer of confession. This is the prayer that David penned upon being confronted by Nathan. Right? You know the words. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Here's the invitation. I want to imagine our spiritual lives and our habits of faith. And I'm really speaking to the hidden parts of our faith life. Right? The, the, the depth of our, our spiritual journey. The inner life that we have as Christians, the inner life we share with God. Can you imagine space in your inner life where we can make time for confession? Can you imagine that the, the copyist of your, of your spiritual life has left room for us to practice and recite confession? Not postponing it. Not making it a, a one-off kind of experience, but, but rather something that is, that is integrated into our spiritual lives. Because I, I believe that, that it's not just the role of Nathan we are called to play, but it's also the role of David. That we should develop habits of confession. We should practice a self-awareness within our spiritual life to be astute to where we have missed the mark, where we have offended God. We don't talk about this enough in our spiritual lives, right? We're embarrassed by it. The cognitive dissonance, we think, well, we're a good person. How could I possibly sin? And that challenges us. But it is such an important part of our friendship with God and our faith in our life together. So what would it look like in your spiritual life to find the space, to find the gap, to insert confession? to be honest and transparent before God. Friends, the big idea of this sermon can be summarized with this one line. If you don't remember anything else, remember this, that we are called to both a prophetic life and a penitential life, both in the inward expressions of faith and the outward expressions of faith, that we're called to embrace both Nathan and David's ministry, the prophetic and the penitential. My hope and prayer for myself, for this church, and for each and every one of us worshiping this day is that we would learn and embrace these roles. For the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the world, may it be so. Amen.